Welcome to God's Grace Ministries. My name is Mrs. Grace McDaniel. We're studying the creation account in Genesis chapter 1. Please follow with me closely through the Word of God regarding the creation account. We will review the phrase in the beginning. In our last Bible study, we focus on Genesis 1-1 that informed us that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. As a brief review, we shall reiterate some of the key aspects about the beginning before we proceed with our Bible study for today. We deduce from the first verse that prior to the beginning, there was no beginning. God existed alone from the beginning as the self-existent, timeless, eternal, and everlasting God in eternity. God has always existed before time and will continue to exist through time and after time. The following scriptures confirm the characteristics of God. Deuteronomy 3327 asserts that the eternal God is our refuge. Isaiah 40 verse 28 proclaims that the everlasting God is creator of the ends of the earth. Psalm 92 conveys that the everlasting God, he was before the mountains were born, or he was the one who brought forth the earth and the world. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Revelation 10, 6 states that he who lives forever and ever is the one who created the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. Therefore, God has no beginning. God is before time. God transcends time. His timeless existence cannot be measured by human time, which he himself created to record the history of man. Thus, in the beginning came about by God in his time, in his eternity, as our self-existent, timeless, eternal, and everlasting God in eternity, God's existence is evident before the beginning that God does not exist in time. Hence, God is not limited to and or subject to and by time. God exists outside of time, unconstrained by the process of cause and effect. Time does not limit God or change him in any fashion or form. Since we understand that time is a non-spatial continuum in which events occur from past, present, and future, God's time is relative to his time in creation and not man's time. Time can be defined as a continued existence in which events pass, which provides humanity measurable quantity. God always existed prior to time. Therefore, God cannot be limited or constrained by a succession of minutes. God is able to see all time equally, instantaneously, and vividly. With the knowledge that time is closely allied with space, and God has created space for all things to exist, the total amount of space he created is that of the heavens and the earth. As the universe is basically three-dimensionally space, space has 
height, width, and depth. Since shape and form are all attributes of space, our God, who is the uncreated creator, must be re reviewed without neither body, shape, nor form, but he is the creator of such. As we conclude our review of in the beginning, we shall look more closely at the phrase, in the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. When Genesis 1-1 declares that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, the word God lets us know that God existed alone in the beginning. These words tell us explicitly that God and only God created the heavens and the earth. There was no one present with God. God is the uncreated creator who is self-existent, timeless, eternal, and from everlasting to everlasting. God is eternal because he is omniscient and knows all things. God is timeless and immutable because he cannot and does not change. Whatever God is like now is the way God was before all eternity passed and the way he will be in the future. The Bible tells us that God is invisible. 1 Timothy 1.17 states, Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Colossians 1.15 conveys that he, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. John 4.24 states that God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. In the book of Genesis, God presents himself as a self-existent, eternal, timeless, powerful, and sovereign God of the heavens and the earth. We find in the creation account that God represents himself as spirit. Although God is spirit, he is not made of spirit. God is not made at all. God is incorporeal and it is not physical, tangible, nor does he consist of matter. He is not made up of any material substance, refined matter, nor of the smallest or thinnest atom that may exist. God is not subject to a body or a bodily characteristic, or bodily characteristics at all. God has no body, shape, and form. God simply exists as a non-created spirit. As a spirit, God is incorporeal. He is not physical, nor does he consist of matter. There is no plurality in corporeality. Because God is not physically tangible, God is not subject to a body or bodily characteristics. For example, when the scriptures try to describe an act of God, it may use words such as walking, standing, sitting, or speaking. When these words are used, these words are metaphorical. God is relating to mankind in words that man can understand in the language of man. With the understanding of God's not being physical, tangible, or occupying space, he is not limited to time, space, and he has no boundaries. He is omnipresent and can be anywhere. God's acidity is supernatural. It makes him independent and he does not depend on anything for his existence. God is supernatural. He is transcendent and he has dimensional powers. He is outside the limitations of dimensions and transcends mankind in every way. As the almighty sovereign God, God operates the universe 
beyond dimensional limits. God is omniscience, omnipresent, and immutable. In essence, God's nature is such that you cannot put it in words. Elohim, we will discuss how God's name in Genesis 1 is Elohim. In Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, it says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In this first verse, the word God comes from the Hebrew form of Elohim. It literally means strongest strength, the strongest of the strong, emphasizing the strength of God. The word Elohim is the name most commonly used of God in the Old Testament, but it is not the personal name of God. The word Elohim has been implied to heathens, other false gods, angels, and judges. However, the word Elohim is a Hebrew masculine plural noun that is continually accompanied by singular adjectives and verbs when it refers to the one true and living God. The word Elohim does mean plural, but not of itself, of the subject, but of the object. Whenever single verbs, single adjectives, and single pronouns are used, Elohim refers unequivocally to the only one true God. When Elohim is used with plural verbs, it is plural. If it is used with a single verb, it is singular. In scripture, when Elohim is used with a plural verb, it is referring to false gods of other cultures. When used with a singular verb, the word Elohim is referring to the only true God of the universe. The International Standard Bible Encyclopedia Electronic Database Copyright 1996 by BibleSoft and the emphasized Bible by Rotherham will collaborate these statements. God has emphasized about 30 times that he, Elohim, alone is the sole creator of the heavens and the earth. As we study the first chapter of Genesis closely, we will see certain patterns developing where God spoke and God said. God is the only one speaking throughout the creation account. The phrase God said is recorded seven times in the creation account. Not only is God the only one who will be speaking with authority and power, but he is the only one who will be creating. There was no one present during the creation account with God, but God alone. The pre-incarnate Christ was not there, nor the Trinity. Trinitarian theology cannot justify their three persons of God doctrine because they fail to understand the Hebrew language and its grammatical structure. There also were no eyewitnesses at all. So by faith, we must take God at his word. However, let us go back to the phrase, in the beginning, God. The word God in this singular construction, when used with a singular verb or adjective, refers to the only one true and living God. When Elohim, which is a masculine plural noun, is used with a single verb or adjective, the reference is always to the one true God. When it refers to false deities or men, it is translated gods with a small g. 
it is important that we understand that the creation account must be understood from an Eastern perspective. Moses was writing to the nation of Israel to explain the family history of their nation, which would show that God was not only the supreme creator of the heavens and the earth, but also that God was their sovereign God that created Israel as part of his plan and not an accident. Genesis 1 was written to the Hebrew people in their day so that they could understand their origin and understanding the prevailing pagan myths of that day. God wanted his people to fully understand that there is only one God and only he alone is divine and powerful. Yet God did not explain his origin nor did he try to convince anyone of his divine existence. As we systematically explore each day of the creation account, we may be able to grasp that mankind was the prime achievement or pinnacle of his creation. Thus, collectively, the creation account's time element or time frame of the six literal consecutive days demonstrate clearly and beyond a shadow of doubt that God who is supreme, highly intelligent, the great designer, the great architect, chemist, scientist, biologist, physicist, anthropologist is the only one true God that no false gods can measure up to. God chose six days to create the heavens and the earth. God did not need thousands of years or billions of years to create the heavens and the earth. He chose six days to demonstrate his knowledge, wisdom, intellect, creative abilities, and his power. Let's reason. If God is the one true God, Elohim, then all other gods must be false. When we study world religion, we find reports that these gods could not create anything out of nothing. These other gods could not only create nothing out of nothing, but they couldn't even transform anything. Therefore, these gods cannot be the true God because they cannot create anything from nothing. No one, can, can be, no one can be God if he or she did not create from nothing as God did when he made the heavens and the earth. No God can be the true God unless that God can claim and prove to be the creator of the universe with all the capacity, power, knowledge, and wisdom to accomplish the task of creating and sustaining. Since we know that God is the true God and the uncreated creator of the heavens and the earth, then all other gods are false. If all other gods are false, then they are non-existent at all forms of idolatry and spiritual adultery must be eliminated. Thus collectively, the creation accounts time element or time frame, which consists of six literal consecutive days, demonstrate clearly and beyond a shadow of doubt that God alone is the supreme uncreated creator and uncaused first cause of the heavens and the earth. In this generation, we are dealing with atheists, agnostics, and higher critics who are attacking the word of God in every aspect, especially the creation account. They have stated that Christians not only do not know how to defend their faith, but they do not know how to in intelligently explain the creation account when challenged. 
The atheists and the evolutionists do not believe that God created the heavens and the earth. They do not believe that God exists. However, we know that Psalm 14, 1 says that the fool have said in his heart, there is no God. Man's mind is finite and limited, yet he acts like he knows all things. Unfortunately, God is not in his equation. In the eyes of God, God holds man responsible for knowing the truth. Knowing the truth is personal and it is a moral issue. When it comes to God, it is not that man cannot believe the truth. He just simply refuses the truth. According to the word of God, the truth shall make us free from ignorance, distortions, false persuasion, and unscriptural teachings. When we read in our history books about Caesar, Alexander the Great, and Cleopatra, we accept the fact from our history books that these people exist. We don't question the thought at all. Yet people today are very bold about trying to disprove that God exists. They even question the Bible and are indecisive if God exists and if God is the creator of the heavens and the earth. Mankind today is basically more anti-God now that they will go so far to say if God really exists, why is it so hard to provide evidence? Yet we do not require evidence from our history books on the existence of Caesar, Alexander the Great, and Cleopatra. People also want to know why God doesn't make his evidence more clear in the word of God. And why do we have to study it? They oftentimes wonder, why do we have to search for the truth? They rather question the existence of God and not the so-called experts who present all kinds of lies and theories in the circular world. From God's perspective, he is God and the uncreated creator of the heavens and the earth. God's existence does not depend on whether we believe on him or not. If God does exist, and he does, God exists whether we believe it or not. It is important that we understand also that as God exists, he does not exist because of the way we understand him to be, but as he actually exists, in reality, our lack of ability to grasp and to understand who God is and who he is not does not serve as proof that he does not exist. As an extremely highly intelligent God, God does not respond to his creation the way his creation wants him to. As supreme God, almighty and powerful. God will not satisfy his creation the way he desires. God will not create his own television station or create a talk show just to demonstrate that he is God. God will not try to prove any points. God will not have you call him on a hotline and ask questions just because you have concerns and doubts. God, who is all wise, understands humanity and knows that no matter what evidence he leaves for them on earth, if they wish not to believe it, nothing he will do or nothing he does will make them believe it. Now let's look at how humans think. Humans with finite minds normally believe thousands of things they do not understand or have immediate access to information. For example, we do not understand all the complexity about how our cars operate and how airplanes fly. 
We do, we do not know about magnetism, atoms, the laws of gravity and DNA. Yet we have limited knowledge how they work, but we know they exist. We have never been on the moon, yet we believe that our astronauts have been there. We also have biologists and architectural findings by geologists who have written all kinds of books about our Earth that convinces us that there is truth to what they're saying, although we were not there. To take this a step further, we have all heard, although we were not there, and did not participate in the studies about World War I and World War II. Yet we know through cumulative evidence that these wars took place through evidence in history, books, uniforms, soldiers' letters, photographs, and personal testimonies. Likewise, the complexity of our physical universe portrays the evidence and existence of God. Why can't we believe in the existence of God through cumulative evidence? It is there. Once we have studied carefully the God of the Bible and understand that we must accept evidence of his existence by faith, other things we want to know about God, such as the questions of origin, purpose, and destiny will become more understandable. Paul, the apostle of the New Testament, told the pagans in Lystra, God has not left himself without a witness in that he did good. Acts 14, 17. There is evidence versus proof that God exists. We will discuss this evidence in the near future. Thank you for joining God's Grace Ministries. God's Grace Ministries is a bi-monthly, 24-minute program released on the second and fourth Saturday of each month at 9 o'clock p.m. Please subscribe. You will be encouraged, challenged, and inspired by the Word of God. You can call for CDs for $10 and DVDs for $15 at 231-894. 0091. Thank you for joining us and see you.